Spontaneous human combustion seems to be one of those subjects that holds a somewhat sceptical crowd among scientists. Some believe that it's caused by external factors such as flammable liquids and ignition sources. Others believe that the body can just suddenly start to burn from the inside out until they are just a pile of ashes. Is this pseudoscience or is there evidence to suggest that such a thing can actually occur? Well, I'm going to take you through three stories of spontaneous human combustion with the evidence that was presented at the time of their deaths. On July 2nd, 1951, at about 8am, Mary Reese's landlady, Pansy Carpenter, arrived at her door with a telegram. When she tried opening the door, she felt the metal doorknob to be uncomfortably warm to the touch and called the police. Reese's remains, which were largely ashes, were found among the remains of a chair in which she had been sitting. Only part of her left foot, which was still wearing a slipper and her backbone remained, along with her skull. Plastic household objects at a distance from the seat of the fire were softened and had lost their shapes. Reese's skull had survived and was found among the ashes, but it was shrunken. The extent of this shrinkage was enough to be remarked on by official investigators and was not an illusion caused by the removal of all the facial features. The shrinking of the skull is not a regular feature of alleged cases of SHC, although the shrunken skull claim has become a regular feature of anecdotal accounts of other SHC cases and numerous apocryphal stories. However, this is not the only case in which the remains featured a shrunken skull. On July 7th, 1951, St. Petersburg Police Chief J.R. Reichert sent a box of evidence from the scene to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. He included glass fragments found in the ashes, six small objects that were thought to be the teeth, a section of the carpet and the surviving shoe. Even though the body was almost totally cremated which requires a very high temperature, the room in which it occurred showed little evidence of the fire. Riker included a note saying, we request any information or theories that could explain how a human body could be so destroyed and the fire confined to such a small area and so little damage done to the structure of the building and the furniture in the room not even scorched or damaged by smoke. The FBI eventually declared that Risa had been incinerated by the wick effect. As she was a known user of sleeping pills, they hypothesized that she had fallen unconscious while smoking and set fire to her nightclothes. Once the body starts to burn, the FBI wrote in its report, there is enough fat and other inflammable substances to permit varying amounts of destruction to take place. Sometimes this destruction by burning will proceed to a degree which results in almost complete combustion of the body. At the request of the Chief of Police, St. Petersburg, Florida, the scene was also investigated by physical anthropologist Wilton M. Krogman. Professor Krogman of the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine had spent some time in the 1930s experimenting and examining the remains of such incidents in order to aid in the detection of crimes. Krogman was frequently consulted by the FBI for this reason, but after examining the scene and reading the FBI's report, he strongly disputed the FBI's conclusions concerning Risa. However, the full circumstances of the death and Krogman's objections to the FBI's version of events would not become known publicly for a decade. Dr. John Irving Bentley was last seen alive on the 4th of December 1966 when friends visiting his home wished him good night at about 9 p.m. The following morning, meter reader Don Gosnell let himself into Bentley's house as he had permission to do so due to Bentley's infirmity and went to the basement to check the meter. 
While in the basement, Gosnell noticed a strange smell and a light blue smoke. He explained the smoke to be somewhat sweet, like starting up a new oil burning central heating system. On the ground was a neat pile of ash, about 35 centimeters in height. The floor underneath the ash was unmarked. Had he looked up, he would have seen a hole about a foot long square in the floorboards above. Intrigued, he went upstairs to investigate. The bedroom was smoky, and in the bathroom he found Bentley's cremated remains. All that was left of the aged doctor was the lower half of his right leg with the slipper still on his foot. The rest of his body had been reduced to a pile of ashes in the basement below. His walker lay across the hole in the floor generated by the fire, the rubber tips on it were still intact and the nearby bathtub was barely scorched. Gosnell ran from the building to get help. He reached a gas company office screaming, Dr Bentley's burned up. His colleague said that Gosnell looked as white as a sheet and was obviously shocked from the incident. The first theory put forward was that Bentley had set himself on fire with his pipe, but his pipe was still on its stand by the bed in the next room. Perplexed, the coroner could only record a verdict of death by asphyxiation and 90% burning of the body. Joe Nicol, in his book Secrets of the Supernatural, gives an account of this event he got from Larry E. Arnold's article The Flaming Fate of Dr. John Irving Bentley, printed in The Pursuit of Fall, 1976. Nicol mentions that the hole in the bathroom floor measured two and a half feet by four feet and details the remains as being Bentley's lower leg burned off at the knee. Nicol mentions that Bentley's robe was found smouldering in the bathtub next to the hole and that the broken remains of what was apparently a water pitcher were found in the toilet. He adds that the doctor had dropped hot ashes from his pipe onto his clothing previously which were dotted with burn spots from previous incidents and that he kept wooden matches in his pockets which could transform a small ember into a blazing flame. Nicol believes that Bentley woke up to find his clothes on fire, walked to the bathroom and passed out before he could extinguish the flames. Then he suggests that the burning clothes ignited the flammable linoleum floor and cool air drawn from the basement in what is known as the stack effect kept the fire burning hotly. Michael Fahati was a 76 year old man who was found burned to death in the living room of his home at Clareview Park, Galway Island on the 22nd of December 2010. His body was partly consumed by a fire that was driven by the wick effect which commonly occurs near and is aided by an open fireplace. His death was the first ever recording of spontaneous combustion by a coroner in Ireland. In the early hours of the 22nd of December 2010, Fahati's neighbour a Mr Mannion was awakened by the sound of his smoke alarm. Mannion went outside to find heavy smoke coming from Michael's house. Getting no answer, he roused local residents and the Garde and the fire brigade was called. Michael's home was searched by forensic experts from the Garde and the fire service. His body had been found lying on his back with his head closest to an open fireplace. The fire had been entirely confined to the sitting room and the only damage found was to the totally burnt body, the ceiling above and the floor beneath him. No traces of any accelerants were found and there was nothing to suggest foul play had taken place. Assistant Chief Fire Officer Jerry O'Malley told the inquest into the death that after a thorough investigation, fire officers were satisfied that the open fire was not the cause of the blaze which led to Fahati's death. A post-mortem carried out by pathologist Grace Callagy noted that Fahati had suffered from type 2 diabetes and hypertension but had not died from heart failure. Callagy concluded that the extensive nature of the burns sustained precludes determining the precise cause of death. In September 2011, the West Galway coroner Dr Kieran McLaughlin informed the inquiry into the death that he searched medical literature to determine the cause of death. The coroner referred to Professor Bernard Knight's book on forensic pathology which states that a high number of alleged incidents of spontaneous human combustion had taken place near an open fireplace or chimney. The coroner subsequently made a statement to inquiry. 
This fire was thoroughly investigated and I'm left with the conclusion that this fits into the category of spontaneous human combustion for which there is no adequate explanation. Following Mr Fahati's death, research biologist Professor Brian J Ford set out to disprove the prime theory that SHC is caused by the so-called wick effect which suggests that human fat will combust on a wick like clothing at room temperature. To test the theory, Mr Ford marinated abdominal tissue from pigs in acetone, a highly flammable substance which the body produces in reaction to alcoholism, fat-free dieting and diabetes and set it alight. He told the Cambridge News at the time, this was used to make scale models of humans which we clothed and set alight, they all burned to ash within half an hour. For the first time, a feasible cause of human combustion has been experimentally demonstrated. However, Mike Green, a retired professor of pathology, said that he is inclined to side with the practical mundane explanation for cases suspected to be SHC. There is a source of ignition somewhere, but because the body is so badly destroyed, the source can't be found. So, do you believe that spontaneous human combustion is actually caused by external factors like the wick effect and ignition sources like fireplaces or cigarettes? Or is this some sort of chemical reaction that occurs inside our bodies that ignites into flames which is yet to be explained by science? As the fictional private detective Sherlock Holmes said, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and if you're new to my channel, why not subscribe so you don't miss the next exciting episode of Strangeries. Thanks for watching.